Welcome to this quarterly update. Uh, I'm Research Director Nathan Bell and today we're joined by our senior analyst, a, a young man who's travelled a long way from Canada to be with us. Uh, welcome Trevor Scott. Glad to be here Nathan, thank you. Now you're going to have to put up with my voice uh, for a little while until we get to the, the interesting stop part of the presentation. Uh, I'll just quickly flick through. So we've got the disclaimer there. Um, as usual, we all care and no responsibility. And so we'll just move along quickly. Um, there's a, a minor theme here I just want you to keep in mind, and it's uh, an old Peter Lynch quote, and it's know what you own and know why you own it. And it's particularly important because we're seeing uh, just billions and billions of dollars continue to flow into passive index strategies, uh, particularly in the US. And that's not just stock indexes, but that's also bond funds as well. And it's really, I think, speaks to the desperation people have for yield, uh, particularly in the US and Europe where interest rates are even lower than they are here in Australia. But also the performance of the major indexes since the bottom of 2009 has been exceptional and as a consequence as value investors, uh, particularly over the last three to five years, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of track records like ours uh, barely keeping up with the market and people are saying, well, why do I need to pay active value managers um, a fee or a large fee when I can go to an index fund. But the problem with broad index funds is, and I think what's underappreciated is that, particularly in the last couple of years, it's really been the FANG stocks, the Facebooks, the Netflixes, the Googles. Uh, these companies that have carried the index, if you take those stocks out, uh, the index really hasn't done a lot. And if you think about what an index does, it actually buys more of the most expensive stocks, uh, or to put it another way, it's value agnostic. And that's worked exceptionally well since 2009, um, but uh, as Buffett points out, um, what the smart money does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. And it's not to say that this can't continue for a long time, but eventually the market is going to reflect the intrinsic value of the individual businesses uh, that constitute the indexes. And so we continue to look for world-class businesses, and we continue to stick to, to values. Um, and I think it's a really risky time just to be buying the indexes. It's been a great decision over the past seven years, but it may not be a great decision for the next seven years. So um, the quote there from Peter Lynch is, know exactly what you own and why you own it. And because if you don't know why you own these stocks, and then if we have a, uh, we expect a lot more volatility over the next seven years than we've had over the last seven, um, when you get into those situations, if you don't really understand what you own, uh, you tend to end up making bad decisions. So we've got our performance there. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, a lot of people ask about uh, why the fund uh, didn't shoot the lights out early on and why it performed uh, poorly compared to the index during the GFC. Um, the actual background of the company goes back to 1999 when we had individual uh, managed accounts and the global fund that you can see here was started in 2004 and a decision was made to delay fully investing the fund initially and that proved quite costly. Uh, so in hindsight, we should have replicated the individually managed accounts from the get-go, and you can see the underperformance in the first couple of years. And during the GFC, a lot of people looked to value funds as to provide protection uh, in those highly volatile times or in bear markets, and we actually saw that the portfolio didn't perform as well as uh, the index, and that was mainly because we got too early into banks. But you can see that um, when we came out of the GFC, then all that uh, lost ground was recovered. So there's a few more numbers there. Again, this is pretty similar for what you're going to see for most value managers, global managers in particular, uh, over recent years. In the last three to five years, we've just been hanging around the index, uh, which is not a bad result uh, considering how much cash we've been holding. And you can see the long-term results, seven to 10 years, uh, are looking much better. So over the next five to 10 years, we think given that the market's just not going to pull everything up like it has since the GFC, and um, individual stock selection is going to impact returns um, much more and that gives value investors an opportunity to distinguish their returns with good stock selection and that's how we expect to get our, our performance over time. So it's not that we're sitting here blaming other people for our results uh, but you do have to have a look at the index and the index has performed very strongly in recent years and we think as a group the index is uh, potentially very overvalued uh, but we think our portfolio of stocks are undervalued and as we get more volatility as more people will start to think about higher interest rates uh, and not just buying things because interest rates are very low, 
um, the individual stocks will, will outperform um, a basket of just a, a broad index. I might just go very quickly back to what we're trying to do here at, at Peters and McGregor. It's, it's always worth recapping. We are a global fund manager. We are trying to buy world-class businesses. We're trying to give you international exposure, but into businesses that uh, we can understand that are, are quite mature and predictable. Uh, we're not into speculation. We're not into short-term investments. We're trying to buy a wonderful business that are going to compound our returns at high rates for decades to come. Now, obviously, if those stocks become overvalued, uh, we'll sell them and look to deploy the money into other businesses. But what we're trying to do is fairly straightforward to understand, uh, but obviously when you're in a very expensive or rich market like we are today, you have to work harder for your opportunities. I don't want to go through every individual stock in this list of, of top holdings, uh, but I do want to point out uh, one particular important point. Uh, and you can see from 12 months ago, there's actually been a lot of turnover in the portfolio to the point where the average holdings have been cut in half uh, from about an average of six years to three years. Uh, and that's not because we've gone short term all of a sudden. It's just that we had a lot of uh, very long time large holdings like Michael Hill in the portfolio and they've been sold. And as we've redeployed uh, that cash, we've actually ended up buying um, more stocks. So instead of having five or six percent uh, positions in certain stocks that we sold, uh, we've now potentially got two positions worth 3%. So we've got a few more stocks in the portfolio, about 20 at the moment. And we really like the businesses we own. We think they're misunderstood for certain reasons. Um, the banking sector, which has been a bit painful over recent years, uh, has really fired up since Trump has become the president. Uh, expectations for higher interest rates and just higher profitability for the banks has sent the share prices up by uh, anywhere from around 15% or more uh, just in the last week. So if you have a look at some of the fund statistics, you will see the average holding period has shrunk in the last 12 months and you'll see there's a lot of turnover and we had a very large distribution last year and that was because uh, essentially we had a, a clean out of the portfolio uh, which was just purely on valuation grounds where we sold a lot of those long-term holdings and we were forced to pay out uh, those profits as distributions. Uh, so it's not that we've changed strategy, um, it's just been the nature of, um, the, I guess, the overhaul of the portfolio. So people ask us, how can we beat the market? Your returns have only been keeping up with the index over the past five years. You know, what is it? What's your edge? How is it that you're going to outperform over time? We've had some charts uh, previously, which we, uh, we haven't got in this slide presentation, but we're currently in the second longest bull market ever. And we believe value stocks are priced to outperform growth stocks. Now, we've started to see that slightly changing. It's been, uh, I guess, if you look in Australia as an example, uh, the mining sector has been very out of favour 12 or 18 months ago, the gold sector, um, and they've started coming back. So you're actually starting to see a lot of these um, cheap or undervalued value sectors coming back to life. The, the financials in the US would be a good recent example for us. Uh, the thing I always remember about even the greatest businesses is that trees don't grow to the sky. So we would love to own Facebook. We'd love to own Google. We think they are excellent businesses, but we're just not prepared to pay the current valuations uh, every, every business has problems at some point and we just need to wait for those opportunities. So as I already talked about, stock selection will distinguish your returns in the next five to ten years in a way it uh, hasn't been necessarily able to in the past five to ten. We don't believe a rising tide of cheap money will continue to lift all boats forever. Uh, valuations of the biggest and fastest growing businesses are quite extreme in some cases. Uh, and just remember, I think half the value of the S&P 500 over the past two years has actually been created by the FANG stocks alone. Remember that volatility is your friend. Uh, we expect a lot more of it now that valuations are quite high. Um, anything, any business that's well understood, pays a decent dividend, uh, is familiar or has defensive earnings or uh, is growing quite quickly, all these businesses have a price to match. So that's generally not where we're finding the value. But over time, as people start to uh, increase interest rates or discount rates in their valuations uh, and they say think about we're actually going to be in a low growth world for a very long time to come uh, you can't afford to be paying 20 25 30 times earnings for for most businesses it's just uh, the mathematics just simply doesn't work so we need to make sure that when we get those volatile periods like august last year and february this year that we make the most of those opportunities because we could be in a period where valuations stay very high for an extended period because interest rates 
aren't likely to go very high anyway. And lastly, we always look for what we consider reliable value indicators, and that's not the momentum of stock prices or anything like that, but spin-offs. Uh, it's usually where a big company spins off a smaller part of the business and lists, uh, uh, it lists independently. And there are, have been a constant theme in our portfolio the last 12 months. If you look through the stocks in our portfolio, you'll see a very high uh, insider ownership bias in most businesses. And we're also just looking for high quality but misunderstood businesses and low valuations. So with that, that's a bit of background on how we go about it and a bit of an update on, on the recent performance. And um, now I want to focus on some of the stocks in the portfolio. We run a concentrated fund. So you know, what I would say on a normal basis, if we came up with four really good ideas per year, that's really all we need. But we've added actually 13 new stocks in the, in the 18 months since I've joined Peters McGregor. So that's a huge haul for us, uh, even though our cash still remains around 20%. Uh, and that's just because of the way a lot of those older holdings, which I spoke of, have reached full value and went sold out. Uh, but also because there has been volatility uh, at times, and, and we're also starting to look a bit further afield than the US. And one of the reasons is that the US stock market has really offered people a lot of what they want right now, which is that feeling of safety, quality, growth, uh, all the things they've been looking for, they've been able to find in those big blue chip US stocks. So if we're going to find the value, we've generally had to look elsewhere and had to look for what's not popular. And so I want to bring Trevor in now. Uh, we'll try and talk about uh, at least three or four of these companies over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes and give you a bit of insight in not just to our process, but also the investment case for some of these businesses, which uh, I don't think too many people necessarily have as larger holdings in their portfolios. Trevor, I'll bring you in. We'll actually talk about a business that we've owned before. Yeah. Uh, you may want to briefly uh, talk about that, uh, but it's U-Haul. Um, people may be familiar if you've watched a lot of American movies that when a family all of a sudden, their father loses his job and has to travel interstate to his new job, he, you often see the white vans with the big orange stripe for the U-Haul um, where they have to move all their gear and, and, and head off. Um, I won't go into any more particular stories. Well, no, that, it's, <laughs> you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. So storage moving, it's... It, within a city isn't particularly profitable. Anybody can just buy a van and then rent it out to people. Where you make your money with storage, um, sorry, with, with do-it-yourself moving, is when you have interstate um, and intercity moving. So if you're going from, um, let's say, New York City to some small town in Ohio, you're generally going to pick the, the, the company that's closest to both locations. And that's where U-Haul kind of just totally dominates the industry. Um, they have eight times as many locations as their closest competitor. So they're able to charge um, extremely high rates because most times when you're going from one city to um, one city that's small, um, there's generally the only option is U-Haul. Uh, so this is like a company that most larger investment managers wouldn't even be able to look at. It's only $6 billion in market cap. But because we're a smaller um, fund, we're able to take these positions and not have any issues with liquidity. That's all right. A six billion dollar fund in Australia. Sorry, a six billion dollar company in Australia would be a blue chip. Yeah, but a lot of a lot of U.S. fund managers can't even look at these companies that, that we're able to. And then, um, what's also kind of a um, misunderstood about the company is, although they're the do-it-yourself moving, they also have the advantage of uh, self-storage. And self-storage business is one of the best businesses in the world. Once you get somebody to move all their junk or whatever into a storage locker, they're very hesitant to take their stuff out of the storage locker and you're able to get away with pretty high price increases per year. And why those two businesses work so well at U-Haul is when you rent a van at U-Haul, they'll give you a free month at the new location. So they're able to acquire customers at a much lower cost than their competitors and it's just a competitive advantage that the two businesses work very well together. And so although the US is a bit pricey at the moment in terms of the stock market, we're still able to find these companies. Um, U-Haul today trades at 14 times earnings, which is below market multiple, and we think that's a really good deal considering the economics of the business. So we're buying an above average business at a below market multiple. Um, so yeah, we've owned it before, and uh, we're, we're pretty pleased that the price came back that we were able to buy it again. And so this was a company that we sold, I think, in around 300 or low 300s. In the past, the share price then continued to rally by about another 25%. Mm -hmm. 
and it's recently come back to around those levels and we bought it again. What's been the more recent reasoning for the share price to come back? Uh, I missed your market to a degree. There wasn't anything. Some of the, the quarterly results weren't fantastic. Um, some of the pricing on the trucks weren't as high. These are all very cyclical issues that doesn't really play to our long-term focus on analyzing stocks. So we're able to kind of see beyond one quarter's earnings and focus on the next 10 years. Um, so this is a business that's eight times bigger than its nearest competitor. It has the best network for people who want to move into state where the real value is in not having to return the car to its original destination. Exactly. So that's where you get the pricing power from. Uh, it has a storage business as well, which is exceptionally profitable. And if you think about this current low yield interest rate world, um, they're very popular assets. And, and there's lots of actually storage business listed, so it's, it's actually quite easy to value that business. Sure. Uh, and also U-Haul has an advantage in its storage business, we believe. Can it, uh, I believe it can uh, get its occupancy up about or fill its um, sheds up almost twice as fast as what we think the average company can. That's that's our estimates. We the company is um, pretty uh, limited in terms of, of that type of competitive advantage disclosure, but it's just our you know not much of an insight to make that when you're getting a free month uh, in terms of new customers, they're going to be much more likely to take up that offer when they drop off their truck than have to respond to a TV or print advertisement. And very quickly, do you want to just talk about uh, the family, the management and the family shareholding? Yeah, so it, it's family controlled um, and they're able to look um, because of this far into the future and make decisions that generally don't have, um, it might impact short term quarterly results, but long term since they're the ones that actually own this company, that's more what they're focused on. And, and we generally prefer companies where the management team is not worried about their job from one quarter to the next. Um, you have to accept it and do your analysis and due diligence before you take the position because obviously if it's terrible management, that's a negative. But generally when we get comfortable with the way management's going, we, we prefer them to have um, total job security. So whenever we're looking at a business and we think it's undervalued, we have to ask ourselves why is the market willing to sell us this wonderful business at this price? And you can see with U-Haul or, or Merco as it's officially listed, there's a number of things that a lot of other fund managers wouldn't like about this. There's a very big, large family shareholding. Uh, we actually think that's wonderful that this company and family has a wonderful track record uh, of allocating capital. And so we want them making their investment decisions, uh, short-term pain today for long-term profitability tomorrow. And um, also, this is a business that is not huge. So if you're a $10 billion fund manager, there's actually not that many shares for you to buy. So it suits our size. So you can see there's actually a lot of non-value related reasons why a lot of fund managers wouldn't own this business, but for us they have all the hallmarks of a wonderful business that can compound their returns for a long, um, long time to come. Trevor, we'll move to the next one. This is uh, one that a lot of people I imagine uh, would be the last sort of business that I uh, <laughs> think that we would own, um, and even I would have said that a couple of years ago. Sure. Um, but it's interesting what you find when you actually look under the hood. Um, take us through the investment case for Twitter. Okay. I Twitter, I'm sure when you look at the logos on your screen, it's the one that, you know, jump out. Everybody's familiar with it. Um, first off, we're pretty comfortable that the network is very strong at Twitter. Um, obviously, Donald Trump, that was a huge part of how he got elected. Um, but the people that use Twitter, the ones we talk to, myself included, Peter McGregor as a company, we're on Twitter. Uh, the network that we use is actually growing stronger month to month. It's not declining. And when you actually get comfortable with that, the downside is fairly limited. The capital structure of Twitter has no net debt. So each, each fall in the stock price, in our opinion, makes it more attractive as long as the economics of the business are what we think. We, we understand Facebook's a fabulous company. Um, and this is, this is an interesting game we can play. I've done this to a couple different people, and I'm going to do it to, to now as a, an audience, I guess. If, if, if you're comfortable that Facebook isn't, extremely overvalued, that it's in a zone of reasonableness, not enough for Peter's McGregor to enter, but if you're comfortable that Facebook is um, a properly priced business, and I tell you that it's $350 billion enterprise value, that's what it would cost to buy the entire company of Facebook today. What do you think Twitter trades at if Facebook's at $350 billion? So I'll let you think about that. I've gotten a totally wide ranging number of answers but it's generally dramatically higher than what Twitter's currently trading for. So 
Today, Facebook is 350 billion and Twitter is currently 11 billion. We actually got in when Twitter was 10 billion. Um, so it just goes to speak that both companies have incredibly you know, optimistic um, potential, great potential going forward. Um, the global distribution that Twitter has is really compelling. Um, we, we listened to John Malone speak the other day about how the, the future of video is shifting more to these global players. And Twitter for us um, is, is very potentially uh, an acquisition candidate for a larger company that's trying to adapt to the online media world. Uh, there's a number of potential suitors for this company. And differently than Facebook or um, Google's of the world, there's no dual class share structure with Twitter. So the voting is, is unencumbered in terms of if a potential acquirer wanted to just take this company out, um, it would be very easy just to organize a bid. So long term, there's potential cost savings in terms of uh, cost cutting expenses. And also there's um, potential, not that we're banking on, that this company could just get picked up by um, a potential media buyer. Something I think would surprise most people, would surprise me, was revenue is actually growing quite frighteningly quickly for this business, um, but the costs seem to be rising just as quickly. So I, th I think the the explanation for that case is Twitter was generally thought of as the next Facebook at the time of the IPO, and it didn't quite pan out that way. So the infrastructure behind Twitter today is for a much larger company than, than is necessary. Um, and that's why the, the CEO is going through and taking out um, about 10% of the workforce. And, and that's just another area that will allow for the profitability to finally f start flowing through. Yeah, Jack Dor Dorsey is the, the, I guess, fairly well-known CEO of the business. And it was great to see him uh, looking to slash cost by, I think, 9% or 9% of the workforce yeah, uh, recently. And, and we really need to see that because often with a business, the entrepreneur or the founder who has the creativity to found the business in the first place is often not the right guy to run the business um, for the medium or longer term. At the moment, Twitter has a cost problem, not a revenue problem. And it's actually very hard uh, you know, for anyone who's worked in business, even a small business, um, sacking someone is really, really hard. And it's, uh, it shows you why consultants are so useful in large organisations because it just, um, you know, I guess the faceless or the non-relationship basis, these people come in and get rid of people um, it takes it off management's hands and it's worth paying for because it's actually quite painful mentally to let people go. So uh, our belief is that uh, Jack Dorsey may not be the right guy to take the business forward, um, but we were encouraged with the cost-cutting efforts that have recently been announced. So we might move on. We'll talk just very briefly uh, about a couple of Chinese-listed stocks. Uh, if you had have asked me five years ago uh, when I was telling anyone who would listen to be careful about exposure to China that... Um, I would be uh, a party to owning a couple of Chinese listed stocks. Um, I would have said you were kidding. But that's actually part of the investment case here is that people are so worried about the macro environment in China and, and how it might relate to Australia that they're actually not doing the work on what are some of the best businesses in the world. And so we own what is essentially the Google and Amazon of China. And it's not that we don't, we don't share the macro concerns. Uh, we certainly do. The, the old way of just stimulating the economy with this massive fixed investment uh, with absolutely lousy returns for those investments, um, that is going to have to shrink at some point and the adjustment period might be very, very painful. Uh, but even if that does affect um, our two companies, which are Baidu and JD.com, we think these are going to be high growth business for the next decade. We're not buying these for the next one or two years. We're trying to buy these wonderful businesses run by intelligent and entrepreneurial management that we can own for decades if possible. So very quickly the case for Baidu, which is the Google of China, makes all its money from the search business in the same way that Google does pretty much at the moment. But recently Baidu uh, has been in trouble because a university student who essentially took advice from a medical operator uh, that was advertising on Baidu ended up dying after taking some experimental treatment. And the regular came in and told told Baidu to clean up its act. Uh, the CEO, Robin Lee, who owns about 20% of the business but has, um, I think it's 55% of the voting rights, uh, he's doing all the right things, he's complying, he's going through all the advertisers, he's trying to clean up the process. But what that's done is what was growth of around 20% a year has flatlined and so the share, prices, uh, the share price has been punished. And the recent results weren't particularly good either. But that's exactly what we're expecting. 
uh, Baidu is doing the right thing now. It's complying with the new regulations. Uh, essentially, it's cleaning up its advertisers. And it's going to make for a much more sustainable business in the future, but it's going to take anywhere from six to 12 months before we see that growth coming back. And in the interim, the market's just not uh, prepared to give the company the benefit of the doubt. So we've bought this search business, which in an environment where these great high cash flow, high profit margin businesses are regularly trading for well over 20 times earnings, we were able to buy it at 12 times earnings. And to us, that's a much better deal than um, paying 25 to 30 times for Google. I also just stress that um, we, we are very um, aware of the Chinese macro concerns. And because of that, we hedged out the Chinese currency risk to our, our fund holders. So um, if you wake up and there's a newspaper article talking about uh, Chinese currency devaluation of 30%, that's not going to affect the actual investments we have. We're more focused on the company than the macro. That's right. And that goes for, for the fund generally. We're not trying to create an alpha or extra performance out of our currencies. We just put hedges on um, when we think there's a large risk of losing capital. So we want exposure to these two Chinese listed businesses, but we certainly don't want exposure to the one uh, over time. And so uh, the second company is JD.com. Uh, this is uh, often called the Amazon of China. And you're probably more familiar with Alibaba, which is a much larger company than JD.com. But the thing we like about JD uh, is it has a CEO named Richard Liu. And he's absolutely parochial about getting packages delivered on the same day. And so if you put your order in before 11 a.m., uh, on the day, usually you will have your product by the end of the day. And if you think about the infrastructure that's being required and the culture that's needed to be set within this huge organisation to be able to get people delivering these things, not only on time, but with quality. Uh, you can imagine if you're trying to get all this stuff delivered frantically and boxes are getting kicked around and not stored properly, by the time it gets to your house, you can only imagine what state the box or the product might be in. But the culture that Richard has set is that that is completely unacceptable uh, and he will not tolerate um, that sort of behaviour from anyone. Uh, and basically, if, if people are found to be doing the wrong thing, then they're, they're cast out of the business. Yeah, that's just the stress uh, to point on and the logistics is Alibaba, they don't handle their own delivery. So if you're a delivery guy, you're just on contract for these companies. You don't have any direct um, relationship. Whereas as JD, you're the one that actually delivers the package. You're working for the same company. And, and that's just um, and really important when it comes to fakes as well, because a lot of these fakes around the world, you know, fake product purses, they come from China. So it's very easy for a delivery person that doesn't work for the company just to, to switch the products out, um, which is why the consumer trusts JD.com's own logistics far more than the contracted model at Alibaba. So Alibaba has stated that they're not going to invest in hard assets in the delivery and infrastructure required to meet these delivery times. Uh, to use a bit of industry jargon, they're going for that capital light business, high cash flow business, uh, whereas JD is being prepared to make these large investments today uh, because um, for the exact reasons that, uh, that we own JD is that while JD can measure its delivery times in hours, Alibaba will continue to measure theirs in days. And over time, we expect JD to be able to offer a much larger range um, than what it does currently and slowly you know, at least encroach uh, or at least compete with the amount of items that Alibaba um, sells, which is much, much larger than what JD does. But over time, we think people will value those delivery times more so than the larger range. And it's much easier for JD to catch up on what it can sell and the range than what it will be for Alibaba to catch up on delivery times. So that's why we like JD. And we think this is a, a structural story or growth story that will last uh, decades. And regardless of any macro hiccups, um, this is a, a business we're, we're excited about. But um, again, our performance or the merit in this business is not going to be married, um, measured in a couple of years. It's going to be measured in seven, eight, nine, ten years. So that's a few of the stocks that we own and the rationale for them. In September, uh, Wayne and I uh, did a large trip uh, around Europe uh, and the UK. I'll just sort of point out a, a couple of the key takeaways. Uh, I went to uh, an industrials conference for three days. It was mainly U.S. stocks, and most of these businesses, um, there's some wonderful businesses presenting there, but the problem is that most of them are trading on about 20 times earnings, for the good ones at least, and what we're actually seeing at the moment is earnings are either flatlining or going backwards, and that's because these industrial businesses 
actually rely on capital expenditure and growth in other industrial customers to sell their products. And what we're seeing with low interest rates is that all the bad operators are still in business. It's creating an oversupply of everything. The pricing power of these companies is weakening. Uh, inventory levels are building up. And so it actually feels like a recession for most of these companies, but you're not seeing low multiples for these businesses uh, because people are prepared to pay above average valuations for them regardless of what the fundamentals are telling them. So unfortunately, it didn't provide any ideas, but we did add, add a number of companies to the watch list. Uh, with interest rates at near or below zero across Europe, investors are treating high quality companies like bonds, resulting in extraordinary valuations. Uh, we went to a mid and small cap conference in Munich um, where there was around 100 companies that presented and we got to see about a third of those. Some absolutely wonderful businesses with high insider ownership, uh, wonderful niche market positions, um, good growth you know, for the next 10 or 20 years at least. And all these boxes that uh, we could tick for these businesses, but we just couldn't tick the valuation box. It was quite, quite regular that those sort of businesses were trading nearly 40 times earnings. And it almost makes sense when you consider that the opportunity cost for European investors at the moment is essentially zero or maybe putting their bank and actually um, having to pay the bank to hold their money. So that's the sort of investors we're competing against. So again, didn't find any value, but um, certainly discovered some wonderful businesses for the watch list. And the final leg uh, was in London where we saw all the major UK and European banks present. And it was actually amazing to see uh, a number of banks that despite their massive, massive impact that low interest rates have had on their uh, net interest margins and profits, they've actually, you know, many of them have actually been able to get the return on equities back above 10 or 12 percent just by going back to the fundamentals of banking and offering uh, customers um, you know, quite vanilla products, but just doing a good job of um, dealing with the customer and providing service and offering these products and, and also just getting out of uh, older uh, prop style uh, trading businesses that um, are quite volatile anyway, but uh, very hard to make money on these days because of the new capital regulations. So a lot of those old businesses that used to be very profitable are not profitable anymore. And those who have managed to adjust and just go back to their customers and provide great service and offer them a wide range of products, have actually been able to do quite well. So I guess it's uh, an idea of Howard Marks would say first level thinking is low interest rates means banks are no good as investments. But second level thinking actually says, well, some of these banks have excellent market positions and they have very loyal customers uh, and they're actually able to adjust to these conditions. And uh, we own Lloyds and RBS still in the UK, which haven't been terrific investments so far, uh, but they've been coming back a little bit recently and um, we think there's a lot of capital that's going to be returned to shareholders uh, over the next three to five years uh, between that pair. Uh, and if the regulators actually, uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the next couple of years, but if they actually start to stop using these banks as punching bags, you'll actually see a lot more capital in the form of dividends and share buybacks coming out of these businesses over time. So just a few notes on the outlook. Uh, we already discussed there's a few industries been coming back to life over the past six months. Uh, we don't typically invest in commodity style uh, investments. Uh, we want our businesses uh, to control their own dest destiny rather than be relying on uh, macro things like commodity prices and China's rapid expansion uh, for their profitability. Uh, but we're also still seeing that it's very, it's a very, uh, it's a sign of a, a mature bull market when a very few number of stocks are pulling up the indexes and that's what we're seeing at the moment with the big technology stocks. Monetary policies remain extraordinarily accommodative. Uh, you know, it's actually like we're still in the GFC, the way the central banks are, are treating monetary policy, uh, but the impact is not working out how they expected. And uh, we think the popularity of these policies is waning. Uh, people are actually saving more because they're earning less on their investments. So that's the opposite of what the central banks actually have in their models where they thought if the share market went up and everyone would spend more money and that would trickle down um, to everyone and it's just not working. So um, you're starting to hear a lot more about fiscal policy and, and with Trump getting elected, I think we'll, it's pretty, uh, pretty much a given that we'll see a lot more in the US. Uh, expectations have increased for higher economic growth and interest rates with investors reassessing stocks that have benefited the most from low interest rates and our financials have been uh, a great beneficiary uh, in the past week. Uh, so much so that um, we might actually be reducing some of those positions over the, uh, the next few weeks. But um, for the moment, uh, we still own Wells Fargo 
and Bank of America in the US. Uh, Bank of America is actually up from $11 to $20 now in the past seven or eight months, which is quite amazing given this is one of the most largest and most well-known and well-researched businesses. To think you can have that sort of volatility in such a well-known blue, ch blue chip stock is quite incredible. And a really important point is we're looking forward to increased volatility which will provide opportunities to be more fully invested than, than what we have been. Uh, volatility is your friend. Uh, I know it often doesn't feel that way when you're, you're actually going through it, but um, if we are going to be in a period over the next 5, 10, 15 years where the prices of all assets are going to be elevated because of these low interest rates, then when we get those periods of volatility, whether it's um, the market as a whole or whether it's just individual businesses, we need, we need to make sure that we absolutely nail those opportunities. So we've just got this slide up. Uh, we've got a few of the uh, basic characteristics of the fund. Um, the main point I'd just like to make though is that uh, we've got Alex there. Alex Haynes is our head of distribution. Uh, he's a very friendly voice. So if you've got any questions about the presentation, about the way we invest, um, or about the fund or how you can invest, uh, please give Alex a call as a, as a first point of call. Uh, and then possibly if uh, you want to talk more about the investments, then um, we're certainly here to help you. So with that, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Trevor does a wonderful job on there with Matthew, our marketing guru. You can also follow us on, on our website and Facebook. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Okay, we've got a question which uh, we're not 100% uh, that we un understand it. I think there's probably a, a spelling error there. But I think it's, uh, it's why the sudden jump in valuations last week. Uh, I don't know whether this is a specific stock. I was referring to or um, whether it's uh, the market in general but uh, I just say since that the Trump victory that um, was actually very beneficial for our fund and and the reason that's been is because uh, we're expecting a more inflationary environment which would necessitate higher interest rates and because of our financials exposure in particular people are starting or the market starting to bake in uh, much higher net interest margins and much higher profitability for the banks, so that was uh, particularly helpful. Uh, on the flip side, uh, that also probably calls for a stronger US dollar, particularly uh, against the Euro, um, who are still doing massive quantitative easing. And so we had an investment in Liberty Global, uh, which is our investment in cable and broadband in Europe, uh, and that got hit reasonably hard uh, initially because um, of just basically exchange rate expectations, but uh, over the long term, exchange rate fluctuations tend to wash out uh, and so we're still excited about the business which is down by more than half over the past 18 months or so and um, so we think this is a very much a, a value stock and, and a great business. Second question we've got is do you see the incidents at Wells Fargo as transitory or wider cultural issues? Do you want me to attack that one Trevor or do you have a strong view? Uh, I, our, our purchase of Wells Fargo wasn't really based on the view of the CEO to begin with. It's more on the fundamentals of the company. The, the trillion dollar balance sheets of these companies are gigantic. Um, and I think the thing, you could tie this in with the previous question on Trump. If you have central bankers keeping rates low in the short term, like in the, in the overnight market, and then all of a sudden you have inflation expectations start going up uh, because of the Trump win, that's the perfect yield curve that, that banking wants. That's the yield curve they haven't had since before the GFC. So. Um, although the stock prices have run up on, on the banks uh, that we've, we've held, there's certainly a potential for a much more favorable um, economic conditions for these banks. So in terms of the, the, the management incidents at Wells Fargo, um, it's bad. I was, I was number one in terms of um, my opinion that, that Stumpf had to go as soon as possible. Um, and he's gone now. Uh, the, new, the new CEO is trying to do the you know the right thing and, and resolve these these issues and I, I think they're they're fixable and you know one or two years from now they're, they're going to just kind of be forgotten. Yeah, I think that's one thing we were very happy with that John Stump had to go. It was clear that this was an issue that management should have dealt with a long time ago, and the whole thing just seems so nonsensical uh, in the sense that it actually didn't help Wells Fargo in any way, shape, or form that uh, these people were opening these accounts. It was just purely. Um, that they were worried about their jobs and just trying to meet these unrealistic targets. So um, it certainly wouldn't have been something that management wanted them to be doing. It didn't help Wells' bottom line at all. 
and all it's done is that a business that's traded for decades on its reputation has now had it tarnished. So the fact that Stumpf has gone and some of his bonuses have been clawed back were all good moves. Uh, we'll see whether there's further to come, but certainly the incentives of, of the staff need to be changed, uh, and we're glad that there has been management changes. So thank you for the question, William. Uh, the second question is a good one. Uh, thanks, Peter. What is your performance objective? Uh, that is, is it a certain percent greater than the index or an absolute number? What benchmark should be used to evaluate your performance? So the short answer for this is uh, we haven't actually stipulated a, a long-term goal. We, we talk about it a lot, and I, I think it's probably something we actually need to do. Uh, I think um, from here on a long-term basis, 9% um, is probably the number that sticks out to me. I think over time, 10% uh, would have been used to be the old figure. Uh, we're not trying to shoot the lights out and invest in small companies or risky things and try and generate 15 to 20% returns. We're trying to buy the sort of business that people can feel very comfortable about owning for a very long point, a long period of time, the sort of business where hopefully you don't wake up and see them splashed across the front paper and see their businesses uh, in demise. Um, now, Wells Fargo was splashed across, across the front page of the news, but the, the news story was actually larger than the actual impact of what's happening. But uh, I think 9% is, is the guide. Uh, we, we haven't officially published that anywhere, but I just think where we are with low interest rates and how highly valued um, all assets are, I'm not just talking about stocks, just assets generally, uh, I feel like 9% is, is very achievable if we just stick to what we do, and that's just buying those great businesses when they're undervalued. Uh, so I think that's a fair measure over the long term. Thanks, Peter. Uh, William, another question. How do you get comfortable with the accounts for Chinese firms and data more broadly? I think, it, yeah, that, that's a great point. It's um, We're certainly limited in terms of the, the due diligence that we can do with the Chinese companies. Um, is there a risk that these um, accounts have misstatements or that you could wake up and, and see these issues? It's certainly possible. Um, with the companies that we own, we have yet to see any of that, that type of um, self-dealing or conflict of interest related material um, with the management. It, it helps when you have insiders that own a significant part of the company. Uh, we have that with both JD and Baidu. Um, but will we ever get 100%? You know, I guarantee that these um, results will never have any accounting things. No, it, we can never say that, which is kind of why we put them in a, a diversified portfolio. Um, but it's, it's certainly a, a, a good question. So a uh, question here from Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh, Nath, you have already mentioned that BAC has run hard. Can you comment further on it? Do you think it has reached or exceeded fair value? Uh, so <laughs> we've been arguing about this in the past couple of days. Um, we haven't uh, sold part of our position as yet. Um, if you're looking at this business two or three years ago, the magic number that everyone was relying on was if you worked through a lot of their litigation and you got the business um, basically back on what you know, I certainly thought and everyone else thought uh, would be a normal operating profit for this business under fairly, you know, I'd say somewhat normal circumstances, um, you know, low interest rates and um, obviously need to be considered. But the number was $2 per share and so um, that would give you a return on equity of around 10% and therefore the business should be worth around $20. Um, that's around book value. And so, um, so what has anything changed and given it's run up to $20 overnight, should we be selling now? Um, if this is going to be a much higher valued business than say $20 a share, then I think what we need at this point is much higher interest rates. I don't think the business has much left in terms of being able to cut costs and um, all the litigation has been done now. Uh, I think this really is the case where uh, Brian Moynihan has done almost as much as he can. Uh, no doubt over time that this is a business that can um, sell more to more customers in the way that Wells Fargo has. Uh, you know, there can be some increased margins as, as interest rates go up, but a lot of that really has been captured by the valuation. So uh, we haven't sold it yet, um, but I'd say we're, we're quite close because we certainly don't want to be reliant on macro factors like higher interest rates um, for the investment case for businesses. We want them to be genuinely undervalued for reasons that we understand uh, and not for macro reasons that are extremely hard to predict consistently. So another question from William, is it a prerequisite to meet management, suppliers, competitors, etc., before investing in a company? You want to take that one, Trevor? 
Uh, generally, we try our best to find an insider um, that, that actually has worked in the industry. I think a mistake a lot of other analysts have done is they go, they talk to the management, they talk to the executives, and they're, they're able to get comfortable that way. We really try not to do that approach, although we, we enjoy meeting with management. We think it's, it's, it's kind of a way to be, um, not conned by them, that would be the wrong word, but be impacted by their positive view of their own business. Um, a CEO is generally somebody that has climbed the, uh, the organizational chart, and they're generally a fantastic salesperson. Um, so again, yeah, that's what we try to do is we try to meet different stakeholders in the business insiders that, um, that have knowledge, um, but also don't have the bias. So yeah, that's, that's generally what we do. Okay. So, uh, just to let you know, we've got another four or five questions on here and, and I'll sit here at the very least and, and make sure they're answered. Um, we can just do rapid fire as best we can. <laughs> Um, Can you please comment on Trump trade war potential impacts? Well, that's Trump, like a question for you, Trevor. <laughs> uh, I'd say, tr this is like my own personal opinion here, but Trump might be a, a closet uh, Democrat, to be honest. He seems that he played the election game as best he, as the, the, given the best possible route. He kind of was the most Republican as possible to a comical level during the primaries. And, and now that he's president, I it seems that he's kind of backtracking on a number of his issues um, in terms of Obamacare. And I just wouldn't be surprised if some of these, um, you know, giant claims of building gigantic walls and, and tearing up trade agreements, um, if they don't actually end up happening. Um, but yeah, if there was a, a trade war, that, that wouldn't be good for the global economy. But um, I'm going to kind of wait and see if that actually gets to, to happening. Um, let's see other questions. So can you give us some guidance on how aligned the investment team is with investors? For example, what percentage of the fund is held by the broader investment team? I don't know the specific percentage, but everybody that works on the fund um, on the research side does have um, our investments with the company. We have a, a portion that we hold directly in the fund. So we like to think that we're thinking like fund holders as well as um, employees of the company. Yeah, I think the fact that we work here uh, most of our private money is in the stock market somehow. We have an investment in the fund um, basically seven days a week. All we really think about is in investing. All our bonuses um, here are tied to the performance of the fund. So even if you, say, pick three wonderful stocks and they don't make it into the portfolio and they perform beautifully, um, you, know, you don't get the bonus. You, you have to get the stocks into the fund. So it's, it's a real... Um, cohesive team effort here and, and we all get rewarded when we do a great job as a team. Does that mean that higher interest rates relate to higher bank profits? Uh, generally, yeah, that's what's happening, especially when you have kind of a sluggish economy right now. You have, you know, 0% short-term rates and then all of a sudden the, uh, the long-term rates go higher. Banks, you know, they pay short and they lend long. So generally, yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, one of the things um, about U.S. banks in particular compared to Australian banks is they tend to hold a lot more deposits, uh, a lot more zero percent deposits. So as interest rates expand, they get the incremental uh, margin benefits that um, are much higher than what they are in Australia. So um, it's not necessarily uh, automated that just higher interest rates means um, huge bank profits. Um, you do have to reprice your liabilities and your assets. Uh, but just to give you an idea, for Bank of America, uh, if the yield curve was to increase uh, by 1%, um, that's a flat, you know, right across the, the length of the yield curve, um, a 1% parallel increase. Uh, that's about $4.5 billion of pre-tax profit, um, or about 15 to 20% of Bank of America's current profit that goes straight to the bottom line. Um, they are the most interest rate sensitive uh, bank, uh, of, at least of the ones that I know. Mm -hmm. uh, Wells Fargo actually sort of reduced its interest rate exposure 12 or 18 months ago. Uh, but I just don't think, you know, my personal view is you're not going to see huge interest rate increases over time. And I think the market's already baked in, um, you know, at least another 1% or so um, increase in interest rates. So it's about the price you pay and, and the value you get. And so even though we haven't got the higher interest rates yet, um, a lot of that's been baked into to the valuation already. There's a question on Deutsche, Deutsche Bank shares as a potential value opportunity. I'll let Nathan talk about that. <laughs> So, uh, it's an investment bank. It's different than the, the commerce, the retail banks. Yeah, so the, the four banks we own are all purely retail banks. They're very vanilla banks, just like Commonwealth Bank or Westpac here in Australia. Uh, they don't rely on trading profits, which um, 
can be very volatile and also aren't particularly profitable these days since the GFC because regulators have really clamped down on those parts of the business. And what the regulators have been very successful in is turning a lot of uh, what should have been retail banks in the first place, but turn them into utilities. So you're seeing those return on equities uh, ratios come right down and you're starting to see something quite similar with the Australian banks. Uh, but the thing we feel more comfortable about the foreign banks is they've already had their um, property collapse and I don't know what the future of Australian property looks like, but um, th there is a potential um, for a downturn at some point and we just feel more comfortable that the balance sheets have already been tested uh, in the US uh, and the UK compared to Australia. So you're in a very different part of the cycle in the US and UK compared to what you are in Australia where it's more like peak conditions as opposed to um, I think in the US we're still only building uh, around a million homes which is um, down from about a million and a half is a long term average and down from about two million uh, prior to the GFC so I showed you just how deep and prolonged uh, the impact of uh, the property has been on the banks uh, but to the short answer for why we don't know Deutsche Bank could be an interesting speculation um, it actually has a massive massive derivatives book but most of it is actually just plain vanilla interest rate hedging so most of it's actually probably fine, but um, the fact is it's just so complicated. It relies on volatile profits. Um, obviously, the valuation reflects a lot of this, but it's for us, it's quality first and, and valuation second. If you um, buy the right business, it will look after you as long as you pay some sort of reasonable valuation. But if you pick the wrong business, um, it doesn't matter what price you pay for it, it's going to hurt. So we haven't bought Deutsche Bank because of that. Um, you know, the returns on capital are really low volatile trading profits, massive derivatives book that we're unsure of, um, a lot of these reasons. But in saying that, everybody already knows this and if, or, if everyone already knows it, then it's probably priced into the stock. So it possibly could make an excellent uh, speculation, but it won't make the Peters McGregor portfolio. So I think that's all the questions we've got. Uh, we'd just like to say thank you very much for listening in. Uh, if you do have any questions, please please give Alex a call. We'll be only too happy to hear from you. Uh, and thank you again, and we'll talk to you in a few months. Thank you.